I'm Darren Vaughn, the Communications Director for the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. And uh, welcome to our video series for the 2023-2024 Big Game Draw. My name is Chad Nelson. I'm the Licensing Operations Manager for the Department of Game and Fish. Um, all aspects of the draw are my job. So, so Chad, uh, Tell me some of the most important things that people need to know going into this 2023-2024 uh, draw season. So, uh, the draw application is coming. It's opening on January 18th. The deadlines to apply for bear and turkey, February 15, March 22 for deer, elk, antelope, bighorn sheep, barbary sheep, oryx, ibex, and javelina. Uh, important things to remember, our mandatory harvest reports in particular, uh, the deadlines for mandatory harvest reporting for deer, elk, pronghorn, and turkey are February 15 to report for free. Uh, March 22, the application deadline is the drop dead date for harvest reporting for those species. If you fail to report before March 22nd, all of your draw applications will be rejected. So it is a very severe penalty. It is in your interest to complete your reports by the deadlines. The April 7 deadline is for Barbary Sheep, Havelina, Oryx, Ibex, and Trapper licenses. So anyone who fails to report any of those um, activities prior to April 7 will have all draw applications rejected as well. Um, one of the most important things people are going to need is access to their online account in our system. Mexico Game and Fish account in order to apply, uh, whether you are calling us or doing it yourself online. If you can't access your account, we have a password recovery option that you can try. The email has to be unique if you are using the email option, otherwise it will not work. If you have trouble, you'll need to call us on the 800 number and we will reset your password. Please do not create a duplicate account. That causes us lots of problems. So what are some of the biggest changes that people should expect as they apply for this 2023-2024 draw? So there are not huge changes. The biggest change, um, we are in the first year of a new four-year rule cycle. So it is absolutely critical that our customers are looking at the correct version of our rules book. You have to have the 2023 rules book. If it doesn't have a bighorn sheep on the cover, and it has an elk on the cover, you're looking at the wrong one. So it's very important because when the rule cycle changes, hunts can change and hunt numbers can change, and that changes your calculations when you're trying to strategize for the draw. Uh, the biggest change is that scopes are no longer allowed on muzzleloaders for sporting arm type three hunts. Uh, you can still use a scope on a crossbow or bow on a weapon type three hunt, and you can still use a scope on a muzzleloader on a weapon type 1, any legal sporting arm. Um, I think there will be a, probably a separate video on muzzleloaders, so I won't get too much into detail on that. Uh, there is a once-in-a-lifetime hunt that's been established for Gould's Turkey, which is uh, pretty cool. Um, there are new once-as-a-youth designations for Oryx and Ibex. There is going to be a population management option in the application for Havelina. The returning Iraq-Afghanistan veteran oryx hunts have been replaced by one oryx hunt that is for all resident veterans, which is, I think, really great. It's going to increase opportunities for veterans. Uh, and we also have a uh, senior hunt, over 70 off-range oryx that has been established for residents and non-residents. The hatchets, big horn sheep hunt area has been split into big hatchets and little hatchets, so that creates an additional opportunity. And one of the exciting things that the department has done in the last year is we purchased a very large property called the Old Bar Ranch, and that is a new wildlife management area, and so there are hunting opportunities available on El Bar WMA now, and some additional areas have also been open for hunting opportunities. Um, depending on the species. So mm -hmm. that is all really good stuff for hunters. 
So going into uh, the draw application, what do people need to have in order to apply? So again, they need an account in our system. Um, if you don't have an account, you can go online and create one very easily. You can call us, we can create one for you. Um, we're very customer friendly when it comes to the draw. Anybody can call us, we will submit their draw application for them. Uh, you need to have the hunt codes that you want to hunt. Basically, you need to know what you want to apply for. We get extraordinarily busy on our phone lines, uh, especially as the application deadline approaches. So, you can't be calling us and then trying to decide <laughs> what you're going to apply for, right? You have to mm -hmm. know in advance. You, know, you need enough money to pay for your draw applications because they are, they don't go to draw until they are paid, right? Um, so, you also need to know which hunts you're eligible for and which ones you aren't. Um, you need to know whether you are going to choose a physical tag or e-tag. Every application you have to choose whether you're going to have a physical tag, and if you're going to choose a physical tag, you have to update your mailing address if it's mm -hmm. not your mailing address. By law, the department is required to collect your physical address, so that is what is supposed to be in your account. It's not a problem if it's your mailing address. Mm -hmm. It's only a problem if you're not going to get mail at that address, because we're going to mail. Uh, if you choose the e-tag option, then you have to be able to show your license on your smartphone, right? And you are able to tag um, whether or not you have service as long as you log into the app prior to leaving service. Um, so that is an option. We are going to go back to uh, the vinyl tags on adhesive backing this year. The only reason that they were paper in the current year is because of COVID-related material shortages for the vinyl. We could not get the vinyl. Mm -hmm. So that was a one-year blip, hopefully. We're going back to vinyl. Uh, people will be able to attach again next year. So the most important thing is you need a strategy. Yes. Right? You need a strategy. What we see a lot are folks who put in three hunts in the best area, for example. Mm -hmm. Or they will put in a hunt with a very low number of licenses as a second or third choice. You can't do that. You mm -hmm. have to stagger your choices in order of drawing difficulty. Mm -hmm. right? Which means that you need to know how many applicants there are for all of your choices. Mm -hmm. You need to know how many licenses are yeah, I've heard it said as your your first choice should be your dream hunt. Your second choice is something that that you would enjoy, something that, that you would accept, that you'd have a good time with. Your your third choice is something that you would just enjoy being out out in the great outdoors with, with people you care about and and just enjoying the activity. That is the appropriate strategy. Yes, you shoot for the fences on your first choice. Uh, you generally don't want to waste more than one choice on a very difficult to draw hunt. Mm -hmm. So if you're putting in three choices on Vias Caldera, for example, your chance of drawing is extremely slim. Similarly with three choices in Unit 2B for deer, we see this a lot. A lot mm -hmm. of people do this. You know, A lot of them are people who live in the Farmington area, mm -hmm. and they want to hunt deer in 2B. Well, everybody wants to hunt deer in 2B, and so, uh, you know, I, I'm sympathetic to folks who live in Farmington, but you may need to apply somewhere else if you really want to go. And, and that is sort of the calculation people need to make. Mm -hmm. What is your goal? If you only want to hunt for trophy animals, then you're only going to put in for the areas where those animals are. Right. But if you just want to go, then you really need to be branching out and looking at areas that may be further away from your home or maybe cow hunts versus bull, things like that, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe bow or muzzleloader versus rifle, mm -hmm. right? To increase your odds. You maximize your chances by increasing, uh, by applying for multiple species, first of all, right? Every species you apply for is a sequence number that you're gonna get. Mm -hmm. So the more species you apply for, the better your chances are of drawing something. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that I have drawn every year except one, 16 years for this reason because 
this is my strategy, <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't play by myself. I don't have anybody attached. Mm -hmm. I stagger my choices. Uh, in order of drawing difficulty, my third choice is usually, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw something like, you know, the, the, the September bow hunt in Unit 18 for you. Right? <laughs> something that is not exactly the, the most desirable. I could give you an example. When I first started with the department, there was a gentleman who lived in Reserve, New Mexico, which is right next to Unit 16A, which is pretty well known to be one of the most desirable elk units in New Mexico for trophy bulls. And he was complaining that he had only drawn once in the previous 21 years, which seems pretty extreme, right? Mm -hmm. Well, when we looked at his applications, he had one choice. The first rifle bull hunt in Unit 16A was his only choice for 21 consecutive years. So to that I would say that you're really lucky that you drew one time yes. <laughs> out of 21 mm -hmm. if that is your application. Mm -hmm. Because you are putting in one choice for the best hunt, you can't expect to draw that. Mm -hmm. You need three choices and you need your second and third choice to be easier to draw than your first. If your mm -hmm. first choice is the only one available and it's extremely difficult to draw, you have hamstrung yourself. So what about people who are going in and saying, oh, you've got the best chance if you apply as soon as the draw opens, or if you wait until the very end? Uh, what, what, what is the truth to, to that in terms of what, what are your chances versus what time you apply? There is no truth in any assertions that there is any advantage by time or anything. <laughs> there is no advantage to be had. We actually, we do have a lot of folks who think we issue all the licenses to non-residents and the percentages that we issue are established in state law. 84% mm -hmm. resident, 10% outfitted, 6% non-resident. Mm -hmm. We do not issue more than that to non-residents. Mm -hmm. That's what we issue. Mm -hmm. So that assertion is false. Uh, there is no advantage to applying earlier than later. It is literally based on a random sequence. So when we say luck of the draw, we really mean it. <laughs> that is absolutely what it is, because a random sequence number cannot be predicted. Everyone has an equal chance of obtaining any sequence number mm -hmm. every year. Right? There is no advantage ever. So, how, how does the draw really work? So there are a lot of uh, there's a lot of confusion about how the draw works in New Mexico. We do our draw differently than a lot of states do. Uh, we do not run our draw by choice. We don't go through all the first choices and then all the second choices and then all the third choices. We go by application. Again, it is based on your sequence number. So the sequence goes from one to however many applications we have. Each application can have more than one person on it. So, because of that, that makes, that makes it a little more difficult to determine your drawing odds very accurately, which I'll get into a little bit more uh, here in a bit. But, application not choice. So, every application gets a sequence number, and our system goes through each application individually, and it looks at first, second, and third choice on your application and tries to allocate you a license. Mm -hmm. If your first, second, or third choice is available, you're going to get it. Mm -hmm. um, but it also has to know how many people are on your application and what pool they are all in. Mm -hmm. right? So it has to track everything as it goes along. It's enormously complicated. It makes my brain hurt very frequently. <laughs> but uh, that is how, essentially how it works. That's the basics. Sequence number is issued. That determines whether you're going to draw or not. And it takes about two minutes. Mm -hmm. The allocation part takes hours and hours because it goes through each one and it looks at the choices on your application mm -hmm. and it looks on the applicants, at the applicants on the application. It's trying to get you your first choice. If your first choice isn't available for all applicants, then we go to second choice. And if it's not available for all applicants, then we go to third choice. Mm -hmm. So that is how it works. It goes through multiple times. There are four rounds of the draw. Round one is 84, 10, and 6. Right? State law percentages are applied. 
and then rounding occurs to determine the number that we issue in each pool. Uh, that is round one only. Round two is 100% resident, right? Up to, up to the number in roll where we stop. So if we go to round two, this is normally when the rest of the licenses are allocated in round two to mm -hmm. residents. If there are not enough resident applicants in round two to issue all the licenses, then we go to round three. And round three is just next in sequence, you know, regardless of pool. Mm -hmm. Right? So that is where we see the combination resident, non-resident applications becoming successful is mm -hmm. in round three. You have to get that far, <laughs> usually, oh, wow. in order to get a license if you have a combination application like that. After rounds one, one through three, round four is deer and elk only, and that is fourth choice. So round four, again, uh, goes through and allocates all the fourth choices. And if there are not enough fourth choice applicants to allocate the licenses for any hunt, then it will be a leftover, and we will sell it in a leftover sale, usually in the summer. Mm -hmm. So um, that is essentially how the draw works. It's, again, it's... That's a simplified version, <laughs> to be sure. <laughs> it's extraordinarily complex. Again, our system tracks every single aspect of every application as it goes. So the further it goes into the draw, the more complicated it gets. Uh, and that's what makes determining your odds sort of difficult. So what would happen if the state of New Mexico decided to run the, the draw by choice? Um, so, we have had folks advocate for this, um, mostly folks who want to hunt in their own backyard, right, mm -hmm. or, uh, or, or want to draw that dream hunt. Um, we have actually crunched the numbers on this. Um, the reason that we go by application is that it is based on a random sequence number. It's literally impossible to say that it's unfair in any way. It's mm -hmm. random. It's mm -hmm. random. So, there's no unfairness in it. There isn't really any unfairness in going by choice either, but when we crunch those numbers, the difference would be that you would have a very slightly higher chance of drawing your first choice, but your chances of drawing a second or third choice would plummet to almost zero. Mm -hmm. So to us, that is not preferable to having an equal chance of drawing a first, second, or third choice, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it's not exactly correct to say equal chance you know, it's, you're right, you, you can draw either your first, second, or third choice. If we went by choice, people would not be able to draw a second or third choice, really. And so, to us, that didn't seem like uh, that was worth it. Mm. Uh, it seems preferable to us to keep it the way that we do it. Yeah, it, it kind of prevents kind of an all-or-nothing system. So, uh, we don't do preference points, um, a lot of states do. The drawback of preference points is that you are having to wait. Mm -hmm. You're setting yourself up to wait. If we implemented preference points, your chance of drawing this year would be absolutely diminished, mm -hmm. right? Our draw is pretty popular because we don't have preference points, subject to the percentages and the sequence number, you have an equal chance to draw every year, mm -hmm. right? I didn't draw for elk last year, but I might draw this year because there are no preference points. Mm -hmm. I have the ability to draw right now. Mm -hmm. So that's why um, you know that's why we don't do preference points mm -hmm. because it's just luck of the draw, right? Everybody has the same chance. Mm -hmm. This makes it pretty popular, right? It's going to draw as popular as a lot of uh, a lot of non-residents because you know a lot of other states do have preference points. What states experience that have preference points is a rather esoteric phenomenon called point creep. And what that is, is that the more people are entering this pool, the longer it takes mm -hmm. to be successful, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a problem for a lot of states that do this. Mm -hmm. uh, they have real difficulties in addressing it. It gets super complicated really quickly mm -hmm. when you are trying to keep track of how many points people have and you know, in Colorado, you could just buy a point, and you know. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it becomes very complicated. Um, we have had some pretty amusing uh, attempts at this, though, <laughs> which uh, we actually had uh, for a couple of years. You could only apply for elk if your birth year was odd. Yep. 
<laughs> that, and, and that would have been next a bad year, year for me. <laughs> and then the next year, you could only apply if your birth year was even. That was a very so, strange two-year period so, where we had that. So half the population could only apply every other year. Yep. Yep. And uh, we did have uh, one where you were required to sit out a year for deer, or not deer, uh, elk and antelope. And many years ago, we had we implemented some sort of system where you were guaranteed to draw on the fifth year, which I found pretty funny when I first started with the department. I was teaching hunter education, and uh, the other instructor that I was teaching with said, yeah, you guys used to do this, and you got rid of it after the fourth year. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, sorry, man, you know, <laughs> it's before my time, so... Um, So if we ran multiple draws by species, what would happen? Uh, so it wouldn't make any difference. Um, we actually run our we run actually two draws. There's a draw for bear and turkey mm -hmm. uh, that occurs in February, and there's a, the big draw in April. Mm -hmm. um, the sequence, the the order of the sequence would be the same, and that's why it wouldn't make any difference, right? Mm -hmm. So currently we have one sequence that goes from one to two hundred twenty thousand. If we did a separate draw for elk, it would just be a different, it would be a sequence that was from one to however many elk out, because we have 73,000. Mm -hmm. The order would be the same, and so it would be mm -hmm. no difference whatsoever. And fourth choice is people have the option to select a quadrant of the state where they are willing to accept any hunt. Mm -hmm. This is a very efficient way for us to allocate licenses that are undersubscribed. Right, so we don't, these are the hunts, if you put in a fourth choice, you are going to get a hunt that did not have enough applicants to fully dis allocate mm -hmm. in rounds one through three, mm -hmm. and that means that they're not the best ones, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. So people need to gauge whether to put that fourth choice in there, because you don't get to choose what hunt you get. Mm -hmm. And if you're applying for elk and you apply for bull, you might draw a cow hunt also. So people need to be aware of the ins and outs of the fourth choice. You have to be willing to accept any hunt. You mm -hmm. don't get to choose it. It's not going to be in the best area. So um, there is also a um, population management option on the draw application. Mm -hmm. We get this question a lot. Do you want to be on the population management call list? And we often have people say, what is that? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, our department, you know, is responsible for managing wildlife in New Mexico. Sometimes we have complaints from landowners or uh, land management agencies that they want to decrease populations on their lands. So if they call us and they want to have, they have a degradation complaint, then we can schedule a population management hunt. And that is where we, you know, give licenses to folks to go harvest an animal on so if that happens, if we schedule one of these and you have applied, you have said, yes, I want to be on the list for population management, number one, you have to have applied for draw hunts mm -hmm. for that species, and you have to have selected yes on the fifth choice. Mm -hmm. We go by sequence number, so everybody who's on the list, whoever is the first lowest sequence number that we have available, we start calling based on the lowest sequence number. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like next in sequence in the Mm -hmm. um, so we offer you a hunt. You don't have to take it. If it's a uh, date you can't make, you just say, no, I can't take that. Mm -hmm. right? And then we go to the next person on the list. So fifth choice does not hurt you whatsoever. What happens with fifth choice is we do rounds one through four. If you haven't drawn in rounds one through four, we're going to refund you, just like you were unsuccessful in the draw. Mm -hmm. And if a population management hunt is later scheduled, then you'd get a call, potentially. That's mm -hmm. all you're doing is putting yourself on for us to call you if we schedule one. So you mentioned attaching um, to, to somebody else's application. Uh, what are some of the pros and cons that come with that? So the reason that people would want to attach uh, is if they only want to go with their buddy, right? Mm -hmm. Or they only want to go with their family, they want to draw the same hunt as someone else, right? They mm -hmm. both want to draw or they're both not going to draw, like I said, because licenses for all applicants on the application right when the application comes up for it to be successful. Mm -hmm. So um, if you 
don't want to go unless you can go with your dad or something like that, then you would want to attack because it's the only way to guarantee that you draw the same hunt. If you are a resident, you should absolutely not attach to a non-residence application. Mm. It is very bad for you. And it's not that you're in the non-resident pool, but you are subject to availability of a license in the 6% pool mm. when you are in the so if no license is available in the 6% pool, you don't draw either because the system is going to allocate licenses to all applicants or none, mm -hmm. right? You get skipped if we cannot issue you a license. So the, the, the drawback of attaching, as I said, is that there have to be licenses for all applicants. Mm -hmm. So especially if you are two residents are attached together, then there's only a small window where that would be a problem for them. And it's, if there is one resident license left, and mm -hmm. there are two residents on your application, then we cannot give you two. We can right. give you one, we can't give you one either, because there's two mm -hmm. on your app. So, you don't draw in that circumstance. But it's only if you're right at the cusp, right? Mm -hmm. Where there's one left and you have two, or there's two left and you have three on your app. Now, this comes into play with resident and non-resident applications, which again, see drawing in round three because residents are subjecting themselves to availability in the non-resident pool, 6%. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean they're in that pool, it just means there has to be a license available in the 6% pool. Mm -hmm. So what other hunts are available outside of the draw? So in New Mexico, the vast majority of public land licenses are issued through the draw, uh, mm -hmm. which is why people get very upset when they don't draw, and that's understandable mm -hmm. to some degree. But um, most of the public land hunts are by draw. There are public land over-the-counter hunts available for Barbary sheep, javelina, uh, bear, cougar, spring and fall turkey. There are private land over-the-counter licenses available for deer and pronghorn, and those correspond with the draw hunts, such that you would choose a, uh, a hunt code that is the same as the draw hunt, and the dates are the same. It's mm. just private land only. You have to have written permission from a landowner. Mm. Uh, there are private land elk authorizations that the department issues to landowners um, that people can purchase from those landowners. Mm -hmm. um, there's a little confusion about this, as people are saying that 84% of these have to go to residents. That is incorrect. They're not issued by a draw. Mm -hmm. So, if there are no pools, there are no percentages. Mm -hmm. Right? So, it's completely open to any member of the public in that case. Yes, anybody can buy them. Private land licenses uh, or private land authorizations can be purchased from landowners. They allow you to purchase a private land elk license from us, um, which you have to do. Uh, that, so private land elk, private land deer, private land pronghorn, there are private land oryx licenses available, there are private land barbary sheep licenses available, um, there are also, I mean, the game hunting license allows you to hunt small game, and you know, we have draw free, which is annual crane and pheasant permits, uh, there are free permits for band tail pigeon, uh, light goose conservation order, and the eastern sandhill crane hunt. Is required for any of those. Mm -hmm. um, a, an HIP number would be required for Sandhill Crane. Um, however, so small game hunting is allowed on the game hunting license. Uh, there are some non-game opportunities as well. Non-residents have to have a uh, can hunt non-game with their game hunting license as long as it's not a temporary license. Mm -hmm. um, and. You know, there are unprotected species that you don't need a license to hunt if you're a resident. Mm -hmm. um, you would need a non-game or game hunting license if you're a non-resident. Mm -hmm. Some of those licenses are not available until July 1st. Private land deer, prong farm, barbary sheep, javelina, fall turkey, federal duck stamps are not available until July 1st. Um, there is an off-range... Uh, a Florida Mountain Ibex license, mm -hmm. which we sell very few of because there are very few Ibex outside the Florida Mountains, <laughs> but uh, it is an opportunity that it's available. Um, yeah, those are pr 
pretty much it. There's conservation incentive deer. Um, again, that's a landowner type of thing when you have to get a code from a landowner to purchase a license for those. So you're looking at over-the-counter licenses primarily if it's not draw or it's private land elk, which mm -hmm. is not sort of over, available over-the-counter, but it's a sort of different system that we sell through. So any, any hunts that are left over from the draw, uh, we will sell through a secondary sale online. Mm -hmm. First come, first served, uh, we just sell them. We also have a youth encouragement elk hunt uh, that was changed in rule this year such that Seniors are no longer eligible. It's back to being only youth. So it's youth encouragement. Uh, those are cow elk licenses in November and December. Uh, there are you know, over a thousand of them. So uh, we sell those usually in early July. The leftover license sale is in um, late June. There are also um, some special opportunities for injured military service members. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a special draw for Oryx on Wet Sands Missile Range. Anybody who has a disability rating of 50% or greater from the VA qualifies. Mm -hmm. So I would strongly encourage anyone to apply for that if they are eligible. It's pretty much the best Oryx hunt there is. Mm -hmm. uh, you're escorted by a Wismer staff usually. So it's a pretty good, darn good opportunity for, for injured service service members. Mm -hmm. uh, there is going to be a new one for Pronghorn on Melrose Air Force Base uh, that we are working to, to create now. Uh, mm -hmm. The eligibility criteria haven't been established for that yet, but there will okay. be. So what is required to uh, apply for one of those military or, or veteran hunts? Well, so the ones that I was just describing are, are very special and they are separate draws that we can uh, there are a lot of opportunities for um, for military and veterans. Again, there is a new hunt for resident veterans for Oryx on White Sands Missile Range, and all resident veterans qualify for that. We have a 50% discount uh, on all licenses, permits, and stamps for active duty military and veterans, residents only though. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you have claimed the 50% discount as a resident veteran, and you have submitted a DT-214 to us, and we verify your discount, then you will be able to see the resident veteran hunt. Mm -hmm. We have to let you see it. Right? Mm -hmm. We have to determine your eligibility before we let you see it. Mm -hmm. So that is the case for all military-only hunts. Also, uh, you have to submit a copy of your orders so that we verify your eligibility. We mark a flag in our system that allows you to apply for that hunt. Mm -hmm. You won't be able to see it in the drop-down unless you have provided the documentation that's necessary. For military-only hunts, that's the a copy of their orders. Um, and for veterans, it's BD-214. So we have to have that documentation in advance. We also have uh, Fort Bliss, people who are stationed at Fort Bliss in Texas, qualify for resident fees only for hunts that occur on Fort Bliss. This is an extremely complicated <laughs> <laughs> law, but... Um, so if you're stationed at Fort Bliss in Texas, you, are, you get resident fees on any license that you apply for on McGregor Range only. If you apply for any hunts outside of McGregor Range, you pay the regular non-resident fee. Mm -hmm. If you draw McGregor Range, we refund you the difference. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, let's see. Uh, also, disabled veteran card holders uh, are not required to purchase a game hunting license. The disabled veteran card is for veterans that are 100% service-connected disabled. Mm -hmm. They actually have to submit a form uh, to the Department of Veterans Services, who then verifies their eligibility, sends it to us, we process your card. The Disabled Veteran Card is a lifetime game hunting and fishing license. You don't ever need to renew it. Mm -hmm. It's the only lifetime license we offer, 100% disabled veterans. Um, so you don't have to buy a game hunting license when you apply for the draw if you have this card. Mm -hmm. uh, and you don't get charged for a deer application if you have this card. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at the drawing odds report, the first thing you would want to know is how many licenses are in your pool. And mm -hmm. We'll go over how to calculate that here in a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, but you also need to know how many people applied and how many people potentially drew. Now that's usually how many licenses are available in your pool. Mm 
instead of like drawn, right? Uh -huh. But um, you really can't get an apples to apples comparison because we show you here's the number of applicants for first, second, and third choice, for example, in the resident pool. And if I look at the number drawn for first, second, and third choice in the resident pool, if I'm looking at first choice, number one, I don't know what the sequence numbers are. Mm -hmm. So I can't say that I have a whatever chance to draw because I don't know how many first choice applicants had a way higher sequence number than someone who had that hunt as their third choice. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely possible for someone who has this hunt as their third choice to draw it, but a person who has it as their first choice to not draw it. That makes it very difficult to really kind of determine, like, oh, I have a 20% chance. Mm -hmm. You can absolutely get a pretty good sense, though, right? Mm -hmm. You can get a pretty good sense because you know how many people applied. Um, you definitely need to be looking at the number of licenses, like I said, and particularly for non-residents because their pool is 6%, right? Mm -hmm. So the number of licenses is pretty critical. And the way that you calculate the number of licenses is a little complicated because it goes by whether or not a license would be added to the total. So what you would generally do is multiply the percentage in your pool by the number of licenses in the rules book, right? Mm -hmm. You're likely to get a fractional number, mm -hmm. and the number is either going to be rounded down or up. Mm -hmm. Determining whether it will be rounded up or down is somewhat difficult now because you have to calculate each pool. You have to calculate all the pools to know whether a license will be added or not. Um, so say you multiply your percent, the percentage by the number of licenses, and you get 8.6. Mm -hmm. 8.6 may round up to 9, or it may round down to 8. Mm -hmm. And you don't know whether or not that will happen unless you know the overall total. So it's a bit complicated, but if you multiply it and you get a fraction less than 0.5, it will be rounded down, no matter what. If it's 0.5 or greater, it will either be rounded up or down, and you have to calculate all three percentages to determine whether a license would be added to know whether it will round it up or down. Mm -hmm. So it's a little complicated, but um, that's how it works. So if there are multiple fractions that are 0.5 or greater, one will be rounded up, one will be rounded down. The higher fraction will be rounded up if they are not the same. Mm -hmm. If both fractions are 0.5, then you don't know, then we can't tell you. But what we can tell you is that statistically it's very likely that the last license will go to a non-resident and not an outfitter, outfitted applicant, and the reason for that is just because there are a lot more non-resident applicants overall than outfitted. Mm -hmm. So usually we see probably 90 plus percent uh, when two fractions are 0.5, goes to non-resident. So anyway, it's important to know this because you need you kind of need to know how many licenses are available so that you can look at the odds and you know ha have some sense of what your odds are. Mm -hmm. Right? You look at the number of applicants and you know how many are available. And mm -hmm. that's how you can kind of determine that. Mm -hmm. Well Chad, I appreciate your time and uh, thanks for uh, for stopping by and chatting with us and giving us some important information leading into the 2023-2024 uh, big game draw. And we wish you all best of luck in this year's draw. Um, stay tuned. We will have uh, more videos coming uh, with all the uh, individual species biologists as we get closer to the draw. Uh, take care.